Hello, this is Michael Choi from Area Specialists. Thank you for tuning in to our vlog regarding cryptocurrencies and real estate. Uh, we've got a special guest, Kevin T. Thank you, Kevin, for joining us. Thank you. He is a cryptocurrency evangelist. Uh, he's been in the game for a little while, so thank you so much. Today we'll cover uh, how cryptocurrency transactions will be done with real estate, how we see it to be done. Uh, what is cryptocurrencies? What is Bitcoin? What are the advantages of cryptocurrencies and why there is so much hype? Kevin T, good friend of mine, welcome to the show and the vlog. Kevin T, he is a cryptocurrency evangelist. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for having me, Michael. So firstly, to start off, um, we want to break it down and explain it from the start without getting too technical. Uh, Bitcoin is the most uh, well-known uh, cryptocurrency, but can you explain a little bit what cryptocurrency is first before we talk about Bitcoin? Yeah, so um, cryptocurrency is is, um, is basically an online or digital-only currency. Um, uh, Bitcoin is the largest cryptocurrency um, and the most well-known cryptocurrency. Um, I almost feel sometimes that uh, calling it a currency sort of um, old school. Not, not not so much old school, but I think it it, it we try and sort of um, categorize things and pigeonhole things into sort of things that we know in our everyday lives. But I'd like to think of uh, cryptocurrencies as more of a um, sort of a, a, or Bitcoin in particular as a as a digital store of value rather than a currency. Um, I, I view it more of as like a commodity, like gold or silver, than an actual like fiat currency, like the AUD or USD. Yeah. Um, but it's yeah, it's been around since 2009. Um, uh, the founder or um, founders uh, went by the pseudonym of Satoshi Nakamura. Um, that yes, that's right for, for Bitcoin. So um, so uh, we don't know if it was an individual or a group of or people who, who started it, um, but. Um, the, the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamura is, uh, is linked with, with um, the creation of, of the Bitcoin and the Bitcoin network. Yeah. And so what, what niche or what gap in the marketplace did uh, cryptocurrencies and, and Bitcoin fill? Like why, why didn't it exist and why does it exist now? Like what's its purpose? What has it helped in? So, so the, um, it came at a, a sort of a, a very uh, poignant time in, in history. You know, we were, we were coming off the back of the GFC and um, you know, uh, there were a lot of people who were sort of disenfranchised with the system, uh, disenfranchised with, with Wall Street and the bankers and, um, and the establishment. And so um, um, this Satoshi Nakamura released this white paper and it was um, you know, referring to um, this, this new model um, of, of digital cash that um, removes the need for a middleman, a bank, you know, um, um, that allows people to transfer value directly to each other without having to go through any um, intermediary, any, any middleman. Um, and so, so... It cuts out delays. It cuts out delays, it cuts out fees, but it also uh, empowers people to have control of their own assets, their own money. Privacy. And, and privacy, exactly. So, you know, I, I think when, when the GFC happened, um, you know, it was really the cypherpunks and the libertarians, you know, the guys that sort of wanted to take back that control and uh, who really sort of helped foster the community and drive the adoption of, of Bitcoin and, um, and other cryptocurrencies. You know, it's, I think the simplest sort of um, um, use case to explain, um, explain Bitcoin is a, a store of value that is uh, censorship resistant, uh, that is seizure resistant. So what does that mean? That means that uh, here is a, a store of value um, that can be transferred uh, to anyone anywhere in the world and it is permissionless, which is to say that I don't have to ask permission from anyone to send it, 
right? So I can send it to someone in the, in the US, in, in Zimbabwe, in, in Africa, in, in China, and I don't need to ask permission from a bank, an intermediary, a government uh, to do that. And it's immediate. And, in, and it's immediate. So, um, so a censorship resistant store of value is, is the, I think is the primary use case for, 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 for Bitcoin. Um, you know, I think, I think a lot of people sort of grapple with the idea of a censorship resistant store of value. Like, like why do I need a censorship resistant store of value? And I think uh, for, for, you know, for everyone in Australia, um, we don't need it. You know, you don't need it, I don't need it. But, um, you know, uh, my, my background is Cambodian. Uh, my, my family, and I think you're, you're half Cambodian. So, our, so my family, um, you know, came here in, in the in the early '80s, fleeing the sort of Khmer Rouge regime, and um, you know, my father and my parents they would have worked their entire lives and accumulated wealth to have it disappear at the drop of a hat, yeah. right? And there was nothing they could do about it. Yeah. Um, a censorship resistant store of value would mean that there is no government. Uh, no militia, no, no nefarious character who could have taken that money away. You know, he, he would have been able to flee Cambodia, come here, and maintain his wealth. Still store his and store his wealth exactly, somewhere. store it where where no one can touch it. And I think so. The problem we see is that in some countries, especially third world countries, uh, that uh, the the dollar just drops or evaporates and is is no worth is a billion dollars of their currency doesn't even buy an apple yeah and so people work so hard they have their superannuation and, and, and they have all these savings and then inflation kicks in the government does something the government keeps on printing money and because they keep printing money there's more of it there's more supply if there's more supply that demands low the money drops and then people that have worked so hard to have a million dollars in the bank that million dollars now doesn't buy anything yeah. as if they stored it in cryptocurrency that would uh, protect that. Yeah. So, uh, and I think the the supply was a very good point that you brought up. You know, with, with Bitcoin, there's oh, yeah. there's a there's a maximum supply of 21 million Bitcoin. Um, there's never going to be any any more than that. Uh, the current circulating supply, which is to say the current amount of Bitcoin um, in the market at the moment, is, is around the 16 million million mark. So that sort of having having a ceiling or having a fixed number that that can't be exceeded uh, is helping with. Um, the uh, the fact that it's an appreciating asset or, or deflationary, so it's not inflationary like like fiat currency, which you know, as you alluded to, gets you know we print off more and more of it all the time. So Kevin, um, I'll, I'll ask some questions that people at home might be thinking: Who owns Bitcoin? What company owns Bitcoin? Yeah. Who's in control of Bitcoin? So uh, that, that, that's a really good question, um, um, and it's a good question for, for new people sort of entering the entering the market. Um, no one owns Bitcoin, which is which is why um, Bitcoin is so important. Um, there isn't any central governing body. There isn't a company, a person, a group who owns Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin is a network of computers, a global network of computers um, that anyone can contribute to, can participate in, and helping to to add to that network. Um, and and that's the that's the beauty of, of Bitcoin. Like, um, you How know, is it computers all around the world? How does that work? Well, it's it's basically um, all these you know tens of thousands of computers all over the world that are um, that run a version of software, the, the Bitcoin software, mm -hmm. and um, they all have the same version of the software, yeah. and they all maintain. Um, or should be maintaining the same um, version of the the ledger. So, you know, all it really What's is, uh, all it really is, is a record of transactions, right? So, it, these tens of thousands of computers all over the world maintain a record of transactions. You can't edit transactions. You can only add to transactions. Yeah. So, you can't go back and retrospectively change a transaction that you didn't like. Um, and because um, it's a network of computers, if one computer were to try and be a bad actor and maliciously change a record, and this is every, the key to it. 
this is the, this is exactly the key to it. Like every other computer would know and would be able to reject that transaction, yeah. and that is why we can move away from having a central um, governing body. Like when when we, when we talk about banks, we we talk about trust and having a central body that you can trust, maintain a record of transactions is important. With uh, with Bitcoin and this technology, we don't need a central person because we have a network of computers that uh, that all run the same software that all help to verify each other's transactions mm. uh, so the trust is is built into the network is built into the software mm. so Kevin uh, how many other cryptocurrencies is there so there's Bitcoin yep. and there's others how many others is there gosh there's a uh, the yeah there's 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 thousands of other other cryptocurrencies and um, and there's new new currencies Sort right of, now. Yeah. While, while we're talking, one was possibly created. Possibly, yeah. There's there's new currencies every day. So, um, so why why is Bitcoin so well known, even to someone that's not in into trading Bitcoin um, cryptocurrencies? Why does the general population know about Bitcoin and not the others? I think um, the, the, the 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 primary uh, reason for that is um, Bitcoin's been around the longest. Mm. It's the largest, um, um, and it's it's had the most. Uh, media coverage yeah. for that very reason. It's been, been around since 2009. A lot of the other newer cryptocurrencies have only been around for uh, you know one or two years or even a few months. And so, you know, over time, um, um, uh, there is there is almost a brand recognition side of it that yeah. that the brand, the Bitcoin brand itself, is has become potentially more valuable than the the underpinning te technology. You know, um, everyone knows Bitcoin, and so that's why when we see uh, new entrants into the market, we're, we're now seeing sort of um, forks of Bitcoin where people are trying to use the Bitcoin name and you know Bitcoin Cash or Bcash yeah. or Bitcoin Gold. and it's got such a strong brand, they it, want to piggyback off. That's that. exactly right. Use the name and then hopefully that yeah. helps them create their own cryptocurrency. That's right. Get some leverage. That's right. So, um, so yeah. and. And, and but Bitcoin is the is the, the one that's been around the longest. It's the largest. It's the most secure, um, and it's the most valuable of them. So, and uh, do you feel we've covered security enough? I, I feel. Is there anything more you wanted to add to security in, in terms of someone's thinking about investing into cryptocurrencies? Um, what can you tell them about the security? Um, I think there's two points that I'd like to make about security. I think um, I think some you know we, we often read. Um, uh, articles in the in the paper and in the in the media about about hacks uh, and having and having um, Bitcoin or Ethereum or other cryptocurrencies stolen. And um, uh, the first point I'd like to make is that when these hacks occur, um, they actually aren't occurring um, on the Bitcoin network. Yeah. Um, the hacks are occurring via phishing scams, uh, via um, you know other third-party software that uh, that people are using um, uh, by other wallet providers, by other sort of um, you know peripheral software and applications that hang off the Bitcoin network. So the Bitcoin net network itself is is very secure. Um, it's not being hacked, um, which is to say that it's it, um, it is being hacked, but no one's no one's actually compromising the network and stealing money off the network. Yeah. Um, they're either uh, compromising individuals and stealing their private keys um, by phishing scams or compromising other software that is used to store people's currencies on, on the network. Which happens with cash. Actually. Which happens with cash, which happens with, um, with oh, internet banking, yeah. which happens with anything. Like if, if I was to get your internet banking ID, you know, send I've you... Hacked a, yeah, I've hacked it, you, exactly. You, you, you've hacked me by saying, Michael, um, your password is changing, put in your ID here. Yeah. I go, oh, oh, I need to put in my password. My bank has just told That's me right. I have to I'll send you my password. Yeah. And then, same thing can happen with cryptocurrencies. So, like anything, you have to be careful. That's right. So, um, the the second point that I, that I want to make is around, around security. And so, um, when when you uh, remove a middleman, right? You remove a bank or an intermediary. What you are doing is you're removing some of the responsibilities that middleman um, provided, um, and security is one of them. So, some of those responsibilities. Uh, are covered off by the Bitcoin network itself, mm -hmm. right, through software. Other parts of the responsibility will fall on the individual. 
So now if you're not um, using a bank to manage your assets, to manage your finances, to manage your money, you need to act like a bank and be responsible for that. Yeah. And so uh, there are multiple ways to secure um, your, your uh, cryptocurrency. Um, there's uh, software wallets, which is basically an application that you run on your laptop or, P uh, laptop or Mac. Um, there are hardware wallets, which is um, yeah, like a USB dongle that you use to, to, um, to secure your, your password. And then there are, um, there are um, offline wallets or, or paper wallets, which is um, a piece of paper that um, you write your private key on and you store that somewhere very, 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 very safe. You hide that, you make multiple <laughs> yeah. versions of it, but no one knows where that's, it is. That's exactly right. So, um, so it's important, you know, when I talk to people about, about cryptocurrencies and people who participate in this market, um, the number one thing that I, I do emphasize is, is security. If, if you're going to um, remove an intermediary, you're going to remove the middleman, you need to be responsible for that. And I think it's it's really um, something that a lot of people um, just sort of take for granted with with banks that their money is protected, that we've got legislation and laws around um, what happens if, if you were to lose your money and insurance to cover it. In 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 this space, there isn't such laws and regulations and controls. Um, you really do need to secure your 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 money. So. At the moment, in the last, say, especially in the last 12 months in mm. Australia, there's been a huge, um, th th there's a lot of conversation around Bitcoin and just recently property. There hasn't been any transactions of property yet um, of someone using Bitcoin to actually buy property. However, you actually can do it. There's a, a few properties on the market around Australia at the moment where the owners are accepting Bitcoin. Um, why would an owner want to accept Bitcoin? Why would someone want to pay uh, a house with Bitcoin or a cryptocurrency? I think, um, you know, people um, uh, value Bitcoin because it is a scarce resource and uh, they view it as an appreciating asset. And so that, that answers the, the why would someone want to... to as, as a seller, as, you, you may want to... Uh, accept Bitcoin because you believe that is more valuable than AUD. Yes, that's right. Um, and and as a as a someone who wants to, to use it to, to make a purchase, um, it's just like any other um, uh, uh, form of of currency um, or, or store of value. Like you you want to be able to spend it on things, and so it might just be easier. For you, if you've got a lot of Bitcoin, to be able to use it as as is, rather than having to uh, transfer it from Bitcoin to an exchange, your own wallet, to and then selling it off and, and transferring it to to a bank, you might if you can make a transaction directly with someone who wants to accept it as payment, then that's probably the, the easiest. It saves time. It saves time. It cuts it cuts out multiple layers of middlemen, yeah. um, and and that's what it's what it's, what it's all about, really. Mm. So. When an owner, an, an owner that is likely to accept Bitcoin or a cryptocurrency as a payment, they're actually more than likely um, going to accept uh, a price that is actually lower than AUD. So just for example, say a house is worth $800,000, uh, an owner wants $800,000 um, to to sell um, to, to to sell their property, they might accept seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth in cryptocurrency, uh, and the reason for this is because they believe that cryptocurrency has more potential. So that's probably another advantage for a buyer that's using cryptocurrency to buy a property. They might go, well, I'm saving money. I'm saving money because I'm not having to buy it in Australian dollars. And uh, if it's Australian dollars, I have to pay a little bit more. So things we need to, to consider is, is, is tax. Um, the, the ATO and, uh, has said that yes, it's, it's okay to use cryptocurrencies or any form of asset to trade asset for asset. That's not a problem. But there's things like capital gains tax, which is when a, a landlord or an investor has made uh, a gain in the property, a gain in wealth and property, they now have to pay tax on that gain, like it, it, it's an income. Uh, that, that's one, one hurdle that people using cryptocurrencies uh, in property have to overcome. The other one is stamp duty. 
uh, when a buyer buys a property, they pay stamp duty. I buy a property for X, I have to pay uh, stamp duty based on the value that I bought the property for. So if we're using cryptocurrency to say, Kevin, you're buying, uh, I'm buying a property off you. Yeah. I'm using cryptocurrency to buy a property off you. You're accepting the cryptocurrency. We can literally, I can, I can go, hey, here's my Bitcoin. Yep. And you go, well, here's the keys to my house. And it's a done deal. Yep. Okay. Um, the, the title has to be changed by solicitor, uh, but it's a, it's, it's a done deal. But there, the, the hurdle there is that the, um, the state revenue office will want stamp duty payable. So how I see that probably working is when, when a, a transaction is done, uh, when the title is changed, yep. either a, some real estate agents will value the property for the owner, uh, a licensed valuer may value the property for an owner, or, or the legislation, there is no legislation around this yet, but legislation might be something on the lines of, how much was the Bitcoin worth in Australian dollars at that time of sale? Okay, the, well then you'll pay the stamp duty on that amount. Um, the legislation hasn't been made on that yet. Yep. But it's it's more than likely like when you transfer a property from brother to brother, yep. uh, sibling to sibling or, or something, you don't always sell it at market value. Yep. You don't sell property at market value. I might be, you're a good mate of mine. Uh, you, so you might say, hey Michael, you can um, buy my house. It's worth 800, but you can buy it for 600,000. Yep. In that moment in time, um, he's allowed to sell his property for under market value, uh, say to say to a sibling, for example. But you still have to pay the appropriate stamp duty as a buyer because it gets valued by a licensed valuer or real estate agent. In terms of the the tax implications, if you're an investor, so there's no tax if you're you're, you're selling a property, Kevin, or you're you're selling a property and uh, it's your principal place of residence, so you live in the actual property. Um, and it's your, it, it's, it's your primary residence, then when you sell it, you don't have to pay uh, capital gains tax, okay? But if you have another house, for example, and this, you've got another house here that you've had for quite a few years, and it's raised up in value, and you're selling it, then you have to pay capital gains. So, um, say you've made $200,000 in that, then you'd have to, have to pay the capital gains regardless of selling it in AUD, Australian dollars, selling it with gold, mm. uh, or selling it through cri cryptocurrency. So that's just something that you need to be aware of. Uh, we strongly advise that you seek uh, legal advice regarding uh, trading with cryptocurrencies. Yeah. I think um, it's really a, a very immature space yeah. uh, in terms of our legal and tax obligations uh, and cryptocurrencies. I mean, you know, I think we're all trying to work through and understand um, what this all means. And th this this is, and the government as well, and the ATO, we're all trying to understand what the broader implications are, because it's a very, very complex issue. When you, when you make a transaction, um, you may pay um, a tax or stamp duty on, on that, on the value of that transaction. What happens if you don't cash out immediately? Yeah. Then and you cash out six months from from when that transaction took place, and the value of your Bitcoin has increased, and then you need to take the capital gains on that into account. Like if, if you if you spent a million dollars and bought a house with a million dollars worth of Bitcoin, and you do nothing and you just sit on that Bitcoin for six months, and yeah, then and the person, the person received. who received the Bitcoin yeah. and then. And then they decide to cash out after six months, but that million dollars worth of Bitcoin is worth 1.5 million dollars now. Like, what are the implications there? Yeah. You know, um, so there's there's a lot of detail that uh, needs to be worked through, needs to be uh, sort of better understood, and um, and we're all we're all sort of you know working through this together. You like know. any emerging technology, uh, laws will never be up to date. Uh, yeah. Laws are out of date the moment they're printed. Yeah. Um, there'll be a new technology created in the next few years um, that the government won't have been able to create a law for because it didn't exist. Yeah. So right now they're they're in they're amongst uh, in the midst of, of making legislation around this, and it won't be perfect. Yeah. There, there'll be there'll be gaps in it because certain, there's there's so many situations that can happen that they need to take into consideration. There's so many precedents that need to occur uh, for them to take into consideration. Sure. Uh, something that we haven't covered yet is how do we do the transaction for property to 
to um, cryptocurrency. Yeah. So I said before, oh, here's my Bitcoin, Kevin, yeah. can I have your house? And you said, yeah, Michael, here's the key. Yeah. How do you see that working? Um, there's diff- I think um, as far as transacting with cryptocurrencies is concerned, there's, there's a number of different ways that that can take place. Um, there are um, providers or services out there that um, help businesses get set up um, to enable them to take payments uh, in the form of cryptocurrencies. Um, so there's, there's many of them out there uh, online uh, in Australia and, uh, and internationally. Um, the, the easiest way for people to make transactions is sending from your wallet to my wallet. Yeah. So, so if you've got a, 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 a cryptocurrency wallet, you just punch in my uh, public address and you can send funds from, from me to you. Yeah. The public address is just like a, a bank account number, yes, just for example. Exactly. It's like a, it's like a bank account CRM number. Um, so that's, that's, that's uh, a way to do it as well. Um, another way you could potentially do it is if you had a physical hardware wallet, which is like a USB dongle, um, and you wanted to have a third party sort of manage that or, or hold on to that wallet, you could physically, you could transfer funds into the hardware wallet, right, into that, um, into that USB dongle and have so it looks like a USB stick. It looks like a USB stick, and you can have someone um, uh, help facilitate that transaction in terms of giving the key and intrust. giving interest. Otherwise, it'll be a bit of a like a swapsy. Kev's got the key. I've got I've got my USB dongle. My USB, and we're like, okay, yeah, done. Yeah. <laughs> but what you what you actually could do is, at the moment, how it's done with Australian dollars, it's it's a, a solicitor takes the money and holds it in trust. So a buyer puts, um, the buyer, the buyer's bank sends the money to the solicitors and the solicitors meet and they go, okay, yep, we'll, we'll uh, pay you the bills. This, this bill, the rates has been paid off. This is all done. Uh, the mortgage, the, ba- the banks get paid the mortgage out. This is the excess money left over. That excess money that's left over, once all the, everything has been paid for, then goes to the owner of the property. The owner of the property now is no longer the owner of the property, title's changed, and it goes to the purchaser who gets the keys. Yeah. Um, the same thing will happen with cryptocurrencies. Someone could have uh, a wallet uh, and just hold the wallet in trust uh, and, and transfer it at that time. Yeah, and, it, and it's, it's pretty cool because it'll be like a physical representation. Yeah. You're, you're carrying this little you know, tiny USB key that could have Potentially millions of dollars on it, and yeah. uh, and you're you know, you're giving it to someone, so yeah, yeah. yeah with the with the uh, credentials to be able to log onto it. Yeah. yeah. And so what would happen is you can prove that just by um, typing in the the serial number of of uh, your ledger or, or your USB stick, for for example, uh, your wallet, your cryptocurrency wallet, um, and that can prove on the computer how much money is actually in that wallet. Yeah. Yeah, I think the the the, the beauty of, of um, um, Bitcoin and a lot of um, cryptocurrencies is they're they're public, yeah. right? So anyone can, um, if you have the the address and you know the address, you can um, get the address information, put it into um, a blockchain explorer, and you can verify any transaction that's going that's in that in that address in that wallet in that account. Anyone can do that. It's, it's public. It's, it's open. So it's it's auditable. Um, so there's no way to sort of fudge that. So um, yeah. Well, in closing, um, we do want to say that it's advised to still get uh, professional advice. Uh, conversations, legislations on this will change uh, ongoingly. Uh, there could be legislation being created right now while we're creating the video. Uh, so it, it, it's strongly advised to still seek professional advice. The, as we're recording the video, the ATO uh, and Consumer Affairs have said it's okay to use cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin to buy property, whether it be for a deposit or for the full purchase price. If you do have any questions though, we'd love to chat to you about uh, the possibilities or even if you just want to talk cryptocurrencies or if you want to talk property, uh, this is Michael Choi, Area Specialist. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thanks, Michael.